All right. Hi. Welcome. I'm Ann Toback, the CEO of the Workers' Circle. We're a social justice organization that builds progressive Jewish identity through Jewish cultural engagement, Yiddish language learning, multi-general education, and social justice activism. For 120 years, the Workers' Circle community has been fighting for immigrants and worker rights, economic justice, and against bigotry and discrimination in the United States. As part of our social justice mission, we're committed to joining with partners and doing the hard work to end systemic racism in the United States. As we recognize that wide scale voter suppression plays a key role in centuries of racism now, the worker circle community is working to help ensure that as many people as possible have the ability to exercise their right to vote in the 2020 election. You can visit our online voting resource by following the link in the chat here, which also brings us to the subject of tonight's conversation. We are thrilled to be presenting the director of the documentary, All In, The Fight for Democracy, which explores the history of voter suppression and the activists fighting to protect the voting rights of US citizens today. All In's director, Liz Garbus, is a two-time Academy Award nominee, two-time Emmy winner, Peabody winner, Grammy nominee, DGA nominee, and BAFTA-nominated filmmaker. Her daughter, Amelia Garbus Kogan, is a student at St. Anne's School and a member of the Workers' Circle Teen Advocacy Program, Youth Stand Up for Justice. Amelia is also a participant in our Great Schmooze Program, which connects young people with older members and right now is collecting people's stories about their first time voting and voter suppression. It was part of her work with the great schmooze that Amelia suggested tonight's program with her mom. So I'm thrilled now to be able to introduce you to Liz and Amelia. Together, they will discuss all in the fight for democracy and how we can plan and organize as a community to combat voter suppression. Welcome Amelia and Liz. Hi. Hello. Thanks for having us. So it's my understanding that Amelia, you're going to, you're going to lead off this uh, discussion. So the floor is yours. Awesome. Um, well, thank you everyone for coming. <laughs> um, uh, I hope this conversation people get some people got something out of this conversation. So the first question I'm going to ask you is, when did you know you wanted to be a filmmaker? Oh, we're going back. Um, you know, actually, when I was a, a year older than you, Amelia, and as a senior in high school, at that time, of course, as everyone knows, we didn't have, you know, cell phone video, you know, that we could shoot films with. Um, but we did have, it was the beginning of when people had home video cameras. And when I was a senior in high school, I made this film about my last week of school by, you know, just shooting everybody's experiences and teachers and last classes and the kids. And um, we didn't have an editing system. At, I didn't have an ed editing system at home or anything like that, but I did sort of make an on-camera edit um, and, um, and showed this film to a group of my friends and their parents. And one of the, my friend's parents was a documentary filmmaker and he said, oh, Lizzie, you just made a documentary. And I thought, oh, I, I hadn't thought of it that way. I just thought I was messing around. Um, but then when I went to college, I always kind of thought about it and I made some films while I was in college. Um, studying in the um, media, media curriculum there. Um, after college, I did some political organizing. I actually did a cross country voter registration drive apropos of our subtopic tonight. And, um, and then decided that, you know, from that experience being on the road in America, just decided I wanted to make films, um, documentary films about American social justice issues. So it started like that. Yay. <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know, my mom's dad um, is a civil rights attorney. So was there any part of you that was thinking about going down that path? Um, and why kind of did you choose film over that? Um, yeah, so my dad um, was a civil, as Amelia said, as a, was an attorney, it was civil rights, civil liberties. And I did think about going to law school. Um, but I have to say that 
around the time that I had graduated from college, um, my father was a little pe more pessimistic about the law profession at that time. Um, and um, I think he had his heart broken. You know, there's a burnout that happens, I think, as so many people know. And, um, and I'm not saying I, you know, that that's what steered me away, but I think I just really got excited by being on the road um, uh, that summer that I did that voters registration drive and the idea of like working out in the real world with people, even though of course lawyers can do that too. Um, doing that as a filmmaker was what appealed to me. Um, but Amelia, I'm glad you brought up your grandfather because um, one of his cases is really pertinent to tonight's film. I don't know how much you even know about that, that particular case, but I can save that story for later. Well, can you tell us a little bit okay. right now? So a, a case that, um, that your grandfather did, my dad did before I was born, he was a lawyer at the ACLU's Roger Baldwin Foundation. And um, in, as folks know who have watched this film or who have you know, studied the civil rights movement, in 1965 um, is when the voter, Voting Rights Act was passed. Um, and this was a federal legislation that Martin Luther King and his associates lobbied Linda LBJ to pass. And the Civil Rights and the Voting Rights Act basically said for states which have a, a history of Jim Crow and uh, racial injustice, their voting laws have to meet a certain standard. And any time that they want to change one of their voting laws, they have to come to the federal government for the federal government to say, okay, this will not disproportionately disenfranchise black, brown, poor, young Americans. That, it will, that, this, that this law is in, in no way um, going to cause disenfranchisement of groups who had historically been, had their votes suppressed. So that was called the Voting Rights Act. Um, 20 days after that law was passed, a woman named Henrietta Wright in a small town in Mississippi um, drove to her county courthouse to register to vote um, 20 days after that law was passed. And she had, was wearing a black power button and she filled out the paperwork and got back into her car and drove back 10 minutes to where she lived and worked with her husband. They had a diner and they lived in the apartment behind. Um, she got out of the car before she could even make it inside her building. The sheriff pulls up and tells her she's under arrest. Why, you know, why am I under arrest? She says, because she blew through a stop sign, he says. Well, there wasn't a stop sign, right? She knows she's traveled this route hundreds, hundreds of times. So she says this wasn't a stop sign. Then they say, okay, well, now we're arresting you for resisting arrest. Um, so she's brought to the city jail and is beaten. And, you know, the black power button is what is, you know, used against her verbally and, and all the bad language and physical violence that um, you don't want to imagine. And, um, and the next day she's sent to a mental institution where it takes her four weeks to get out again. No trial, nothing ever, you know, there are no charges that are ever pressed. Well, the ACLU and my father took her case to sue Mississippi um, for this violation of her civil rights. They did not win, it was an all white jury, um, but she had her day in court. So if you ask my father, you know, about these kind of Pyrrhic victories where you don't win, but you're, you're using the system, <laughs> you're taking those baby steps, um, you know, he'll say that, you know, she got to have her word in front of that sheriff that that was meaningful for her, even though they didn't win. But in any case, that was a, a case of his that I learned about at a young age. So I think even though as a white upper middle class person growing up in New York, I had some sense that the right to vote was um, still a privilege. It was not a right actually and was still part of, of white privilege. And, um, and so that story has always stuck with me. Um, and uh, it certainly made me very passionate about making this film. Do you remember the first time you voted? Hmm. 
You know, I wish I did remember that. I don't remember that. But what I do remember is taking you guys, <laughs> you guys voting with me. And I do remember, you know, you and Theo being in strollers and us going to Philadelphia to knock on doors and, you know, ask people if they're registered to vote or did they need, you know, information on how to vote. And, and that, in fact, you as a very young child were very enthusiastic about this project, um, as you still are, as I find you every night texting for your, for your candidates of choice. Um, so um, I don't remember my first time voting. It must have been for Bill Clinton. Um, but I, I can't say I remember it. And you know, those were different times than they are now, I think. I think, I know that what, for instance, when my niece turned 18, like she was voting and she could vote for Hillary Clinton was, you know, the most exciting thing. And I think there's a different feeling right now in politics um, than there was at the, at, at, you know, in the eighties and nineties, although there shouldn't have been. Oh, Eva asked in the chat, what was the name of um, the client that Gramps helped in Mississippi? Yeah, and I could share um, an article he wrote about her. It's really interesting. Um, there's so many interesting facts about this case. It's quite a story. Her name was Henrietta Wright. Um, and Eva has the name spelled right, and the last name is W-R-I-G-H-T. And I could share, um, my father wrote a book called Ready for the Defense. And um, that's her, her story is the first chapter in that book. But I could also share with this group um, an article he wrote. It's a fascin it's a great, it's a fascinating case. Yeah. Um, so kind of pivoting a little closer to the present. Um, why did you choose to make this film? You know, I, I had been thinking about making a film about the right to vote um, ever since the 2016 election. Um, but I'm not usually in kind of an essay documentarian. Um, that's not usually my style. And I couldn't quite figure out how I would tell the story with the kind of films that I feel like I'm, I'm good at making. And then um, in, a couple of years later, it was Stacey Abrams herself. They, her, she had an agent who called and Stacy came to New York and met with a bunch of different filmmakers to talk about making this film. And, you know, then once I thought about Stacy, then of course I knew how to make this film because I had this personal story. I had this central spine that could carry the story emotionally. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't feel uh, like, you know, purely like an essay, which is nothing wrong with that kind of film. It's just not the kind of film that I'm used to making. And, um, in any case, um, so Stacy came to New York and she sat with some different filmmakers and then happily she picked us. And um, I invited then my co-filmmaker, Lisa Cortez, who is a woman of color who made the film with me um, from beginning to end. It was very important to have, um, you know, somebody who had a different lived experience at the top of this film as well. Um, and um, so that's how it all started. It started with Stacy and Stacy, was very clear at the beginning, I don't want this to be the Stacey Abrams story. She said, I don't want this to just be like, oh, about my 2018 gubernatorial race. It's an exciting race, you know, it has all the drama. Um, but if you make it about one person or one, one party, then it becomes, oh, well, that's Georgia, or that's Brian Kemp, or that's Stacey Abrams, you know, she's a sore loser, whatever, the, it, you can write it off. Um, when you look at the history <laughs> and the clarity and the intentionality of voter suppression, not just in Georgia, but all over these United States, um, you can't write it off. It's overwhelming, the evidence. So it, she was very clear in the beginning. She didn't want it to be the Stacey Abrams story. We were able, Lisa and I were, were able to negotiate, <laughs> you know, some Stacey Abrams story, but a lot of history too. Um, and that was the the happy place I think for this for this film. Did anything surprise you while making the film? You know, one thing that surprised me was when Stacy told her story. And I, again, I don't know how many people have have seen the film, but when you see it, you will see the scene. Stacy Abrams running for governor in the state of Georgia, extremely famous in her state. Actually, the national media is watching her. 
She has news cameras behind her. She shows up to vote in her precinct and she is told that she's not eligible to vote that day. Um, she was able to get, she said, you know, they said, oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Abrams, you know, it says here you've already voted, which would mean she had sent in an absentee ballot. And Stacy said, you know, I'm sorry, I've never sent in an absentee ballot in my whole life. I've always voted in person. And um, of course she was able to get it sorted out. But what it tells you is how many hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, Georgians and Americans and other states too, show up at the polls, are told there's some kind of bureaucratic error that they can't vote and they go home. And we know this is, you know, what we can see from the film is this is a feature, not a bug in the system. And um, what was incredible to me was just the way in which, um, you know, even with a very famous high profile person who's running for governor who's about to go vote for herself, that, you know, the poll worker sitting there and saying, sorry, you know, and um, yeah, it just makes you wonder, um, well, it, we know how often that happens. Well, we know some amount of how often that happens and we can imagine how much more of that we, we, we you know, when you don't have the CNN camera behind you and you don't know your rights, um, how many people are, are disenfranchised. And it's not an accident. It's not accidental. It, it wouldn't happen so much all over the place in certain communities if it was accidental. Um, I'm looking at the Q&A. Um, so how did Janelle Monet agree to make the song turntable for the film? So for those of you who don't know, the very um, end of the film features Janelle Monet's song turntable that she wrote for the film. Amelia and Alice were the first two, um, some of the first two Americans to hear, I believe this summer. Um, yes. <laughs> how, how did it happen? is we asked, <laughs> but I should say we asked with the help of Amazon, who was our studio and is also doing a television show with Janelle Monet, um, Amazon is. And um, Lisa Cortez and I were, we wanted to, and we had sort of budgeted some money for an original song to go with this film. We really wanted an anthem, you know, something that people could listen to and get positive and hyped up and excited about voting. Um, you know, while not ignoring the baggage, you know, that, that, that comes with this moment. And, you know, we thought of Janelle as the ideal person for this, you know, she's very political and, but she's also, you know, can lift you up and get you moving. So, um, so with Amazon's help, we asked her um, and um, her people and team, they all, they're all, a lot of them are from Georgia. Some of them went to Spelman where, where uh, Stacy went historically uh, black, uh, HBCU, and um, they had they felt very very kind of close and wanting to do whatever they could to help further Stacy's mission, um, and um, and I think the song is just amazing. And the music video she did, which we had nothing to do with, um, is also really amazing. If you haven't seen it, look at Turntables from Janelle Monet on uh, YouTube. Yeah, yeah, it's an awesome song. If if anyone has any questions, feel free to type them in the Q&A chat um, and we'll answer them. So my next question is, is there anything that you learned from past films that you made that was really um, important knowledge to have uh, or that you felt was really important as you were making this film? What I really felt that's different from a lot of the films that I made was that I, I needed this film to feel very universal. Like I needed this film to not feel like, you know, cause there is a way to make this film where you go to New Hampshire and follow the kids at Dartmouth who are organizing for the students right to vote, where you go to Florida and you follow Desmond Mead and you follow the Florida Rights Restoration Project, which was the group that brought voting rights back to uh, returning citizens, those who had, um, those who had, uh, uh, prior felonies and had completed their time, um, you know, but, and, and I think my normal filmmaking instinct is let's follow Desmond or let's follow like, but in this case, like I need, I knew I needed to interview Desmond and talk to him, but I needed to interconnect Desmond's story to the black codes um, of, you know, and the Mississippi plan of 1890, which cre created felonies um, for the condition of simply being poor. Right. And so what happens when you, when you freeze, um, when you free the slaves, right? What happened in the in Reconstruction was you have four million people who had no 
share of the wealth that they created for this country who are now looking for work, right? So what do you do? You create a, a, a crime that's called loitering. So that could mean somebody just like sitting on a park bench or a city bench looking for work could now be arrested. So we see this very direct connection between slavery and felonies and then felony disenfranchisement, which um, is you know what the battle that's still being fought in Florida today. So this is all just to say that like some of my filmmaking instincts might be let's follow Desmond and let's be in the streets as they're knocking doors. But it was so important to put that story to have historians talking about you know the Florida felony disenfranchisement that went as back as 1868 and the Mississippi Plan of 1890, which created all these laws, which which in which normal life or the real the condition of not having money became a felony. Um, that led to voter suppression, especially of poor and black and brown people. Yeah. Um, did you receive any pushback um, from people specifically in Georgia about the movie um, at all during your time making it? Well, my, my fellow filmmaker Lisa and I reached out to um, folks on all sides of this story um and um and you know brian kemp for instance who was stacy's opponent refused to give an interview we wanted to interview chris kobach who um donald trump had appointed to run his blue ribbon panel on voter fraud which found no voter fraud or not statistically significant voter fraud um but they all refused so when we talk about pushback there were certainly um non-cooperation from conservative voices other than one. Um, but since the movie has been out, um, I have been extremely pleased um, that we have not, uh, you know, that nobody has found anything factual to turn us up on. There have been some, you know, tweets from some conservative representatives in Georgia attacking Stacey um, and her Hollywood agenda. And they've talked about Stacy and her pro-abortion stance as it relates to this film, which is a non-relationship <laughs> because our film, but it's the kind of just whatever you can throw it at people, even when it's off topic is, is the kind of pushback we've seen, but it's been okay. Um, I know my favorite moment of the movie is when you're talking to Stacy's parents and you know, I don't want to spoil anything for those who haven't seen it, but when Stacy um, was in high school, she was the valedictorian. One of the things that the valedictorians in Georgia got to do was go to the governor's office um, and kind of have, have a celebration of their hard work. So when Stacy was in high school, she um, got the police officer who was at the front of the governor's office, who was letting people in, did not believe that um, a young black woman could have been the valedictorian, um, much less with the name Stacy, um, which he, which this police officer, you know, thought of as a white name. And my favorite moment is when Stacy's parents, um, when thinking back about the incident, incident, Stacy's father said, you know, I, I spoke with a gentleman in a very um, rough way and made it clear to him that if he didn't let us in, he, he would get hurt or something or something he might along not, those lines. He, it might not be healthy for him. <laughs> it might not be healthy for him. Yes. Um, so what are some of your favorite moments in the film? Mm. Well, I also do love that, that, um, that story because, you know, it showed, you know, her father, her father was also a voting rights activist and it was arrested during the civil rights movement. Um, so you can kind of see something of where Stacy gets her, her fight. And you can also see in that moment, which I love Stacy's mother sort of like when her father is getting like, I said it wasn't going to be healthy for him. And she, the mother is like, Oh my God. Um, and that's a dynamic that Stacy warned me about, which, you know, of course you see in all families. So I love that too. But, um, I, um, I love um, the the story. I mean, I think one of the the powerful stories that, um, especially a lot of white people I've heard kind of coming back to after seeing the film respond to, which is interesting, is the story of Maceo Snipes, who was the World War II veteran who fought in Europe for the United States against the Nazis, and comes back to Georgia. And there's a white supremacist on the ballot. Um, and he's like, I'm gonna vote. 
and um and uh, I, I we, we have some kids who just came into the house, so I'm sorry if you're you're hearing some background noise. Um, and Maceo, if you haven't seen the film, you know is a is essentially assassinated for for voting that day. Um, and because there's only one picture that exists, it's one his one military photo that exists of uh, of um, Maceo. We worked with an animator who um, whose skill was just amazing to me. Um, her name is Diane Ejeta, and she um, is um, she she just uh, I thought brought so much creativity and heart to that story. Not telling it literally, but telling it sort of symbolically. Um, and um, Carol Anderson, who is the um, professor at Emory University who tells that story and the author of a great book called One Person, No Vote, I think tells the story with such clarity and passion. I just, I love listening to her and I love seeing Diana's animation. I love the animations too, those are amazing. Um, so a particularly poignant film moment of the film was when Stacy's grandmother talked about her fear um, that she had when she was voting. What were you thinking um, or, or what were your thoughts, um, and what did you feel about that when uh, when Stacy first when Stacy first said that? Yeah, I mean, I think I'll, I'll just I'll tell the story briefly in case people haven't seen the film yet. But it's a story that Stacy, she's running for governor, and um, she goes to visit her grandmother. And her grandmother is, um, she says, she's always watching TV. She's usually MSNBC. So you got to, you know, sit down and wait for her to be ready to turn off the TV. I don't know what's her favorite show, but apparently you can't talk in the middle of certain shows. Um, <laughs> and Stacy comes and finally when it's her time to talk, she, the, her, her grandmother reaches for her hand. You know, and now her granddaughter is running for governor of the state. Um, she reaches for her hand and she wants to make a confession. And the confession is um, that the first time she was eligible to vote, she almost, she was so petrified and so fearful that she almost didn't do it. And I think she told that story with a combination of shame, but also with immense pride that her daughter was now the first African-American woman on a major running for, what did I say? Oh, daughter. her granddaughter was the first African American woman running uh, on a on a the major on one of the, on a Democratic or Republican ticket for governor of the state, um, and it's just an extraordinary trajectory to see in these three generations, um, the Voting Rights Act, where her grandmother still has the memory of the of the, of the dogs and the billy clubs, and you know folks that she knew like Maceo Snipes, you know who who paid for their lives with with voting and did not believe that that right was something that really was hers. She knew about the Voting Rights Act, but she didn't believe it was safe to go vote. But she did. And I think, you know, see ha seeing that conversation amongst intergenerationally, um, you know, progress takes a really, really, really long time. And I know sometimes also, like, especially in this moment, we feel like we're going backwards in time. Um, but there has been progress. I mean, that, you know, to Stacey didn't win. You know, she should have won. Um, but to just see that conversation between grandmother and granddaughter, um, you know, the possibilities for Stacey are, were very different than those for her grandmother. And so sometimes it's easy to become totally dismayed with where we're going as a country. Um, but when you look at it with that grand swath, there's something very hopeful there. Yeah, so I just wanna recognize that it's 6.30. Um, so if people need to go, that's totally okay. We don't wanna take up um, any of your time. Uh, but I do have a few more questions if people want to stay on. Um, Who's this moderator you got? <laughs> <Just kidding>. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of them being here. Sorry, I'm going to pull them up. Um, you once said a documentary film can't tell the whole truth. Um, what truth did you leave out of this film? Mm. I never said that. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, a documentary film, well, look, nothing, you know, um, for instance, I told made a film about Nina Simone. The film is 100 minutes long. 
you're not going to tell her whole life story. There are going to be songs and moments and stories that those who knew her, those who loved her, those who didn't are going to accuse me of being, you know, of leaving out and not telling a whole truth. And I think what a filmmaker does when they tell a story is they find a story, they find their North star of what truth is. But, you know, if, uh, but there could be many different people who look at, the history of voting in our country and tell a very different story. Um, perspective is everything. We get our facts right. Um, we always reach out to thinkers on all sides of issues to present um, a healthy argument. But of course, my perspective is coloring everything I do. And um, there will be stories and truths that are not included um, that other people will feel like is missing. Um, and of course, that's just the nature of making something um, that covers, you know, 250 years of history in 90 minutes. <laughs> it's, it's impossible. And also, of course, there's perspective. Yeah. Um, before I ask the next question, I just want to mention that I learned so much um, from the Workers Circle Civil Rights trip um, that in the South um, that I went on when I was in eighth grade. Um, Abby and Eva, thank you guys for organizing that trip. Um, so many people got so many things out of it. Um, so just wanted to put that off. And walk, you walked across that bridge that you saw John the Edmund Pettus and bridge. Stacey Abrams, you know, all walking across, which is a wonderful experience. Yeah. Um, so also to kind of bring you back to, to some of your beginnings, how did your Jewish upbringing um, shape your values and activism? Um, an interest in social justice. You know, it's like the invisible hand of the social justice commitment that are, you know, is very lively, is very much present in our culture. I wasn't raised, I wasn't bat mitzvahed. My family did not belong to a, a, as a congregation, but, you know, my father um, and mother had, you know, were activists. They, went to every protest. My father was a civil rights lawyer. And I, you know, I don't think you can separate that kind of work from their Jewish, Jewish traditions um, that, you know, of course the worker circle certainly represents. Um, so, so I think it's in everything, even when it's not um, in an organized fashion, it's, it's, it's part of who we are. It's in our DNA. And of course, there's a long history of Jews and African Americans working together on civil rights issues that, you know, my father was part of. And I know that now, Amelia, you're part of too, so. Yeah. Um, so my last question is, what do you want me and other young people um, to take away from the film? Mm. You know, I do think that the young people are the most powerful underused weapon for social justice that our country has. Um, you know, I love, I know time is up, so I'll just tell the story, but you know, you look at the election of AOC, right? And two weeks before um, she was, um, but two weeks before election, the polls had her down 15 points. Why? Because the polls poll likely voters and they don't pull a lot of young people who weren't so likely to vote all the time in all the elections. Election day, she beats her opponent by 10 points. It was the power of the under 30 year old vote. Um, and you wonder how many candidates don't mount even a race or a campaign because numbers show them too far behind. You know, was a would AOC not have run if she wasn't so bold and ambit, you know, because the numbers would have been too far against her that she couldn't have raised money for a campaign, but she did it. And so you think about that and you think about if young people started showing up <laughs> to the polls, the way they showed up for AOC. And of course that depends on what kind of candidates are running, but what kind of conversations we could be having in Washington, you know? And I do think that, um, again, young people possess enormous power. They are the future. They are the numbers. And um, some people say your vote doesn't matter, or maybe you don't feel too excited about any candidates running. But um, the little by little that we get there, we can have more candidates that represent who you are um, and what you believe in. And um, it may be slow going, but, um, but I think the race of AOC really showed something very special about the power of the young vote. 
So um, thank you, Liz. Thank you, Amelia. Amelia, you did amazing. <laughs> <laughs> thank my, you. Thank you for having us. Oh, it was so much fun. And is this the first time you've interviewed your mom? I believe so. Yeah. You are, I mean, you're, you're a professional. It was thank you for giving us that opportunity. Oh, it, it's been marvelous. And I want to add a plug. I had the chance this week to see All In the Fight for Democracy. And I, I just want to tell everyone watching that you may think you understand the nature of voter suppression, and maybe you do. I mean, everyone's educated to their own degree, but I learned so much. I mean, this was such an impactful uh, documentary for me, and I came away understanding so much more about the scope of the elections and what's turning elections and really what, what we all are charged to do to fight voter suppression in the United States and why it's so intrinsically connected to racism and so much prejudice and, and really um, outcomes that are not reflective of the population. So our democracy really is at stake every time we vote. And um, Liz, your movie is so critical right now. So I, I urge everyone, we keep getting questions. It's on Amazon Prime. If you don't have Amazon Prime, there's ways you can get it free for, I think, a month. Consider doing it. It's really- Yeah, you can sign up for Amazon Prime for a th free 30-day trial and just put it in your calendar to cancel on day 29. <laughs> right, or um, 10 after you yeah. watch this yeah. film. Because All In is really the one film you should watch today, tomorrow, because we really still have a chance to help um, people vote right now. I want to encourage everyone, have a voting plan. I have my plan, everyone should have their plan. And um, if you, ha and I, I, don't, I do wanna also add that this Thursday, um, the Worker Circle is going to have another Zoom program, Courageous Conversations, Reclaiming Our Vote with Andrea Miller. She is the founder of the Center for Common Ground. This is Thursday, October 15th at seven. Um, the Center for Common Ground is an organization that's fighting back against voter suppression in communities of color across the South. They have helped register hundreds of thousands of people to vote and figured out how and, and, and help them check their voter status. And now they're helping them create voter plans. And the Worker Circle's working with them over the next month. Um, we're training people to make calls to voters in the South and help them figure out voter plans. Because that's, if you watch Liz's film, that's part of the issue. You need to know where you're gonna vote and how to get there. It's not always easy anymore. And make sure that you have a backup plan in case you're challenged, what kind of ID you need. These are things people in the South need to know. And um, the Center for Common Ground is all about um, in empowering and equipping people with um, the information they need to successfully vote. So this Thursday at 7 p.m., we're gonna be speaking uh, with Andrea Miller, the founder of this incredible organization. So I wanna thank you again, Amelia and Liz, and thank you, Liz, for creating this critical documentary. So important, and everyone really, go see it. Um, it, it, it is so important today and in the future, because it's not gonna end this November, we're going to have to do a lot of hard work to fix all that's broken with our voter system. And it's not going to happen right away, but um, there's the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, and there's more um, to come to help fix our system. And um, I know at the Worker Circle, we're, we're committed to being part of the long run, uh, the, the long haul effort. So thanks for joining us tonight. Have a great night. And um, the last thing is make your voting plan now. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Thank you.